Hello, everybody, and welcome to another installment of the Harrisburg University webinar series. My name is Aaron Spina, and I am the Associate Director of Admissions here at HU. And today we're going to be talking about one of our most exciting programs. Uh, it's interactive media. So for those of you who want to get into the realm of game development, uh, going into, you know, characters, storylines, development, all these different areas that really pique your interest, uh, we're going to have a lot of great information here for you today. Uh, Today joining me is actually going to be uh, Professor Charles Palmer. He is the faculty lead for the interactive media program. And we're also going to have Dr. Tamara Payton going to be joining with us today as well. Uh, as always, uh, the information is being recorded. So you have the ability to go back and watch the webinar at any time, just like any others. You are muted, but feel free to ask your questions through the Q&A. We have some time built in at the end so that way you can ask your questions and we can have our faculty answer that for you. Uh, but without wasting any other time on my end, I want to be able to throw it over to uh, Professor Charles Palmer, and he's going to talk to you about the interactive media program. Hello, everyone. Uh, as Aaron said, and Aaron, thanks a lot. Uh, my name is Charles Palmer, and I am happen to serve as the program lead for interactive media. Um, and what we're going to do today is really just talk about what is the field, uh, what is our discipline, um, what is it that we cover in this program that will make you designers or put you out into the world to be able to serve on teams? Um, being the person who sort of drives some of the vision, uh, conduct the research, um, or making things better all in all. So if you don't mind, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, and my, there we go, that should be good. Um, and we're going to talk about the program itself. Once I learn how to click on my mouse. So interactive media, and we're going to start just by talking about, you know, the fact that it's not me. Um, it's, it's a slew of faculty members um, at both campuses who help deliver the content around this particular program. Um, I, I won't go through everyone's name here, but we have researchers, we have uh, seasoned academics, we have practitioners. Interactive media is one of those spaces where we bring both the theory together with the application. So you will have courses that teach you about research. You will have courses that teach you the theories behind why, why we improve products, um, how we go about doing those, talking about the steps of process, making sure that you understand everything that's needed before you even start working on your project or a project at all. But then we mirror that with a number of faculty members who are also there to guide you through how to use the technology, how to apply those skills to actual real world business problems. And it's together, it's both of those groups together, which really um, make this a program that's unlike anything else that we've seen out there, where we've taken students who have absolutely no understanding of some of these disciplines and show them how they can be productive members of companies, how they can go out and take their own personal visions and drive and create something new. Um, with that being said, today I want to talk about a couple of things. And first and foremost, I'm going to describe what interactive media is. Uh, I want to talk about how the program is structured. We're going to take a look at an overview of the curriculum itself, show you what you would be doing in the program during your first semester, and then probably the easiest way to talk about this discipline is to show examples of student work. Um, give you a chance to sort of not just think about uh, the science or the methodologies behind things, but what students have done with them since. So let's jump in. First and foremost, uh, interactive media is a bunch of different things. And so you can see the text on top there, but um, it, it's this, as I've mentioned already, you know, we're bringing research technology management, we're bringing the graphic and industrial and specific skills about visualizing things all together to make a thing. Uh, whether it's gaming, mobile apps, websites, uh, interactive solutions in any form, whatever your passion, if you are passionate in this particular sp space, we can actually help you to take all of these components and bring them together. The students will learn the concepts and skills of new media, communication, social sciences, and technical sciences as well. And all of these things work together, again, not to just be a, uh, a thinker, but to also be a doer in this case. Um, but often when we think about this and I, and I distill it down for people, interactive media or IMED that we call it internally, um, it's really the science that focuses on the development practices 
for making something better, whether it is a mobile application or it is a survey that's being taken out in the field or it's a website or it's a game that's being developed. Interactive media looks at how do you improve upon that, whether it's from the creation side at the very beginning or even coming back over and analyzing something to determine if you've actually hit the marks on making something or improving upon it. Um, there are a few universities that have programs in this particular space. We've actually taken ours and broken it up into three concentrations. A concentration at the university is where you study your major, in this case, interactive media, but then you focus in on one specific area. And it's not a hyper focus because you still have a lot of flexibility on looking at other things, but your courses, your schedule, the cohort of students you'll be with are all sort of focused around these themes. And they are advanced media production, user experience design, and purposeful game design. Each one of those has a variety of different skill sets. They have different processes, different types of application. There is definitely overlap between them. And that's why we branched the, or we've put them all under the interactive media umbrella so they can show not just the differences between them, but also the similarities. It also means that if a student, uh, let's say after the first semester, they thought they were going to be in one space and they decided to move to another one, or even after the second semester, if they switch, they haven't lost any time because we have this core, uh, these core courses that all students are taking. After the second year, it becomes a little bit more difficult, but all in all, that's the plan. So you guys are going to be taking or starting a career in uh, interactive media, and you're going to gain a bachelor's degree. No matter which university you go to uh, in North America, a bachelor's degree means 120 credits. Those 120 credits are broken up into different categories. Uh, and a credit is essentially you're showing up for class one hour a week um, uh, for 15 week, 14 or 15 weeks, and that makes one credit. But for every one hour that you're in class, you'll also be spending about two hours outside of class studying the material, doing assignments, preparing for the next lecture, or doing homework. But that 120 does break down into some categories. First, we have foundational. This is required for any batch bachelor's degree, regardless of which university you go to. Um, there might be some slight differences. I mean, there are some things that we do uniquely here, but things like taking three credits of English or three courses of English, three courses of math. You'll have some general, very wide ranging topics that are covered in your general edu education courses. Then these last three are unique to HU. We have a seminar. You'll take one each year. Uh, the first one <clears throat> is mostly about how do, how do I become successful at college? The second one looks at how is HU different and what are the things that make us unique? The third one looks at, uh, and this sort of splits between the second and third, um, but it looks at how do I start applying the knowledge that I've learned in class to my own research or to my own projects? Um, and then the fourth one is, okay, I'm leaving college. Am I prepared? What do I still need to do? Um, who do I need to talk to? How do I find out about what is life like after college? These have been very crucial in helping students navigate throughout their career here, but also, as, I, as you heard, preparing for the outside world. Experiential learning, we're going to talk about a little bit later, but these are the things where you get to really apply your skills. You will take two experiential learning courses, and then the third one is an internship. All students are required to do a three credit internship. And then the last is, uh, this is listed as 12, but it's nine to 12 credits of free elective. That means if you're studying in one area and you decide that um, there's a course at the university that's not in your major, you're free to go ahead and take that as long as you have the prerequisites. As an example, I had a student a few years ago um, studying in advanced media production who also had uh, strong interest in uh, environmental science. Uh, the oceans was her primary area of focus, and she really wanted to go into use her interactive media skills to go into public policy. So she filled those elective with courses that were in the life sciences to make her better prepared. Alongside of the foundational stuff, you also, all students will be taking these core interactive media courses. I'm not going to talk about all of these. Uh, I, I don't want to go through all of the individual courses, but because you'll be getting a lot more information on that in the future. But this sort of walks you through the steps um, of 
what am I going to be studying and how is it going to be laid out? And it'll start off with two courses in your first year, which are very in, uh, instructional, um, but they're also uh, introductory so that you're prepared for knowing what they are. You know, we've talked, I've talked about the concentrations and we'll look at them in detail a little further, but really what we like our students to do is that first semester not pick a concentration. Instead, spend those first two semesters really finding out what each of the concentrations are and what their differences are and find out what skills you have that make uh, one or two of those really the core things that you should be probably studying. Um, you'll take some computing courses. You'll learn how to visualize things, how to use various softwares. Um, you'll look at how projects are actually crafted. These are very professionally oriented and they happen in your last year here. In the individual concentrations, you will have courses as well. So we saw the foundation, we saw the interactive media core, and then you tie on to that the foundational courses. And you see the electives are listed here again. Um, just to reiterate, sometimes we'll have students that will take one concentration and then add courses from the others just because they are of interest and they have the prereqs um, or they want to augment their own concentration itself. So there are the three of them laid out, advanced media production, uh, the development uh, and delivery of digital media content, uh, user experience design is the research specification design and creation of human centered stuff, uh, which is like doc, which is um, Dr. Payton likes to describe it that way. Uh, I now notice that purposeful game design has a, a copy and paste issue there, uh, but purposeful game design is where the students are looking at what are the aspects of the game industry that are required prior to production, meaning how do you develop story? How do you think about interactions and affordances in a game that are going to make it a, a, a positive experience for the player itself? And so they go through all of these design phases um, of the game development process. Um, just to dive in a little deeper, in that first year, first semester, students are taking an introduction to interactive media. This is actually a course that is taught by three to five faculty members where we all come in and we talk, uh, normally spend about three weeks describing the individual disciplines where students learn a little bit about it. They get to apply some of the basics of it on in-class projects. Dr. Payton, myself, um, and Dr. Boudreaux normally drive that, but we've been incorporating more and more of the IMED faculty. It's a great introduction to what this field is. You get to work with your peers on small projects. You even get to find out who's skilled at what as you all go through learning the roles and the processes needed to develop content. And then in the second semester, you will take a uh, uh, another introductory course, Introduction to Digital Media, which again is broken up following along the concentrations, but it dives deeper mostly into the technical and the applied side of things. So where 140 looks at mostly the theory, 110 looks at the actual application of that theory onto small projects. Between the two of these, by the end of that second semester, students have a really strong grasp of what the concentrations are, but also what their skills are and which ones they apply to. In uh, the second course, Interactive Media 110, students will select a concentration at the beginning of the semester, but then have the entire semester to make uh, alterations and changes to that if they decide along the way that there's something else of interest to them. So that's a big overview and, and obviously there's a lot more that we can go into um, about uh, the different aspects, but I do want to, one of the best ways I've always find, found of talking about this content is to really look at what students are creating and what they're learning in the classroom and what experiences they've been able to have while they're students. So what we have here is a series of, of examples from various students and the work that they're done. Um, they have done. I'm going to go through and walk through uh, not all, but some of these and just sort of highlight some of the things that our students are doing. Dr. Payton is going to join me in a little bit and she's going to talk about um, one of the projects that one of her students worked on, um, either their project one or their project two. So with that being said, let me jump in here and start looking at different things. In the project work, and so what we're looking at right now are app development as well as social media or online things as well. 
Um, this one here, which was done for the Turnpike, uh, Pennsylvania, um, it was actually done by the Easy Pass team. They're uh, a really great group of developers, and they had an application that they developed, and they realized that it wasn't getting a lot of traction. People were having problems with the application itself, um, not installing it, but more of how to use it and how to find information. They came to us, and what we were able to do with them was assign a student to work on this as a project for them. So that student really went through and did a, a really great analysis of the application itself, how it was being utilized, and what problems users were having. They took all of that information, that research that they did on the, on the current, on the previous app, and said, how can I improve upon that? And then they built mockups um, and they used a, a software product to make it interactive and then went back to the folks at the Easy Pass, and they didn't do this on their own. They went back and forth a number of times. But in the end, they had a final presentation and they, they were able to present a revised version of the software. Uh, within a few months, the developers took that exact product and went ahead and made a new version of their application and went live with it. Um, and we got some feedback about two semesters afterwards um, that it was being installed and people were enjoying it and they were getting less uh, queries about how to use it. And that's essentially how we evaluated whether or not it was a good project. The students started off with identifying that the, the developers are getting these numbers of questions over a period of time about this software, and we need to improve upon that. And then later on, they come back and use that as a gauge to say, well, how many questions are we getting now? Are people still having the same issues? And if so, what's the frequency that those issues are coming about? And that's a great way of thinking about how do you know if your project actually performs the way you expect it or if it reaches its goal? Purposeful game design is one of those areas where students uh, flock to interactive media. Um, there are a couple reasons about that. Most of you probably enjoy playing games, and sometimes playing games translates into creating games. Um, but it's also possible that playing games sets you up not as a game developer, but other degrees or other areas inside of, of games themselves. Oh, sorry about that. I'm getting weird things happen on my screen. Um, so, so our students are studying game development and design, primarily design. And so they're going through a number of courses, which uh, actually I should probably add courses on these. Um, but there's a number of activities that the students are working through as they're understanding what does it mean to make a game? And what is the process? What is the production process? What is the design process? What is my logic and rationale that goes into every decision that's being made? Our students use a variety of different platforms. We're really platform agnostic here. Um, and, and Dr. Boudreau would, would uh, berate me if I didn't also add, we are not a technology-based program in purposeful game design. The design process is really taught without focusing on the tools needed to make a thing. The students will fill their free electives and other course, their elective courses to actually go and learn the hands on uh, of using, let's say, Unity or the Unreal Engine. But more importantly, in this program, you need to understand why. Why should buttons look like this? Why do you tell a story in this manner? Why do you introduce characters like this or create experiences and challenges that meet these goals? And so through research and through study, you figure out all those whys, and then you use your applied courses to go ahead and produce things. Um, one of them, Dr. Payton, I'll get to you uh, in two slides. Um, one of them here was our student uh, from probably four years ago now. He graduated, um, but during his internship, he went to Philadelphia and worked for a game design company, a small game design company. Um, game design companies have the weirdest names. This one is Fish Potato Games. Um, although he went in to be a level designer, he did that for a month and realized that he didn't have a strong knack for it. Um, he had done the research and the studying, but when he went to the application of it, he was struggling. He was interested in games. He was interested in being a developer of games. Um, he's still doing game development now, but he was having a trouble, a, a tough time with this. Um, it was a small company and they allowed him to pivot. From this, he actually became a game marketer. And so he started looking at how do you market a game before it comes out? And how do you look at social media and use that as a push for it? He took the company and increased their social media presence by a factor of 10. Um, so from four, 400, I believe, to about 4,000, right in front of their, develop, uh, their uh, 
announcement of a new game they were putting out. So the company was ecstatic because they had direct, they could show direct correlation between an increase in social media and an increase in sales of a game that they were publishing. Um, and so for them, it was a very valuable experience. We also have students do things in VR. Um, there's a game developer conference that on occasion our students will go to. Um, there are so many things involved in this. Um, but really, as we looked at those projects and it was look at a couple more, I want you to think, um, think about a couple of things. Everything the student works on requires a process. And that process uh, will take a number of different shapes. Um, and what you're seeing on the screen here is just one of them. Um, and so there's a pre-production, a production, and a post-production. Um, sometimes there's a research phase. Sometimes there's uh, testing is actually broken out to another. But all in all, what happens is an idea is crafted and at the end, something is done. It's done as a team. And in this program, you learn to work as a team as well as become masters of content on your own. So process is just as important as the finished piece. Along as our students learn about process uh, in the classroom, we also make sure that they're being in touch with the outside world. So students are regularly meeting with outside developers who come in and talk about the design process, talking about the development process. Students then graduate with direct contacts in their concentration in the industry. Some of these have even turned into internships. Uh, a good friend of ours is a senior UX designer or UX developer at Sony. He actually works in the PlayStation team. Um, he announced to our students at HU first when Sony uh, opened up a new uh, internship program uh, in Boston. Um, and so having these connections to the outside world gives our students a lot of uh, access to the industry. Um, and then I, I thought it'd be good if Dr. Payton could jump on, uh, Jason, if you switch over to her and talk about one of the students in the UX uh, UI space. Sure, so hi everyone, I'm Dr. Payton. Um, so I had a student who was really, really interested in Dungeons and Dragons. And she wanted to figure out a way to bring uh, a love of Dungeons and Dragons to areas that didn't, of uh, Pennsylvania, that didn't have access to game stores that were outside of urban regions. And so she did a bunch of research in her project and she figured out what are some of the options. Uh, she did a bunch of reading around how Disney manages better experiences. And she came up with a concept of a portable gaming, uh, a portable gaming store slash gaming room that was in sort of like a food truck environment. And all of the walls inside are all screens and it would show up. You could rent it. It would show up in a, or it could just show up in a town and you could rent time in it and you could bring your friends in, show them what Dungeons and Dragons are. There'd be a professional person that can run a game for you. It would be sort of that thing that you could do for uh, bachelorette parties, bachelor parties, for kids' birthday parties, uh, for just you know team building, whatever might be of interest for the reason for getting someone to understand what D&D is about. And so she ended up designing the end-to-end -end thing from the website to what the app would look like, to what the, the, to what the truck would look like um, as a result of doing the research that she had done. So that's one of them. Um, another thing that one of my students did was uh, learned, he was really interested in doing UX for user experience for websites and was particularly concerned about what happens on a website for someone who needs help, uh, who may not have the same abilities as everybody else. And so he did a, a large amount of research on what accessibility guidelines exist on the internet, what is best in for UX in websites for people that are differently abled. And he managed to use that to parlay it into a project working for a pet rescue company for his internship. So those are a couple of examples. Great, thanks a lot, Dr. Payton. It's good seeing your face. Uh, and so our students, uh, as you heard there, tend to use their projects to learn more about the industry, but they're also uh, actually, yep. Uh, but they are also entrepreneurial in nature. Some of our students go off and take their project idea and look at turning it into a business. Um, we had one student, speaking of Dungeons and Dragons, we had one student that built an entirely new system that wasn't fantasy based, uh, and they went and kickstarted that and started a, a, an entire company on it. 
Um, there are other things that our students get involved with outside of class. Um, sometimes the content that they learn in the class can be applied in different ways, uh, such as we have students that will do work with the Harrisburg uh, esports team, the Storm, um, behind the scenes, either developing graphics or being on the production team. Uh, we have students that will do animations just to create their own animation reel. We have students that start getting very interested in photography. Um, we have so many ways that our students are applying their skills just on their own. But then the university has a, a number of centers where students go and actually get employed. So some of our students that do internships, they don't have to go anywhere to do their internship. They can do it right within the university. So the UX lab, which uh, it has a name, but it hasn't really been announced what the name is, so I just have it listed here generically. Um, and the geospatial lab are places where our students have historically been working. And, uh, and it's great that our students who might not have the means to go and uh, travel to Houston for the summer to work for an organization. Um, maybe they're local to Harrisburg or Philadelphia and they're looking for something, uh, or, or maybe Philadelphia or Harrisburg in this case, maybe they're looking for something to work on campus during the school year. They have the ability to do that. I just want to finish up here. I got a couple more minutes and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Um, one of the things that's extremely important to myself and all of the faculty are collab collab <laughs> collaborations, um, not just interdepartmental or inter uh, or cross concentrations, but also across programs as well. And so over the years, we've had students branch out and reach out to students in other programs to assist or to collaborate on the development of something. So a couple examples here is uh, the same student who worked on fish potato games. He also built a VR game and he reached out to a computer science student and they worked on that together. We had a group of students or two students that were really interested in video production and audio production and producing things for Twitch or for YouTube. And so what they actually did was they created a series of training videos for one of our uh, environmental science instructors, I'm sorry, integrative science instructors um, that she could utilize in the classroom so that she didn't have to break up time uh, to instruct on how to use some of the equipment, students could go off online, go to a YouTube channel and watch these. And so what those two students did was they worked with two students in integrative sciences who they were the subject matter expert and our students became the producers of that content and they developed a series of these and it, it worked really well. And then in uh, integrative sciences, uh, we had students that looked at uh, there's, a, I'm sorry, in our forensics program, there's a course where students do facial recognition. Uh, <laughs> wow, I can't talk today. Facial reconstruction, where uh, a scientist, a forensic specialist might be looking at the skull and then trying to identify what that person looked like. And that's actually a course at the university. And while our students, they had a difficult problem where they only had one skull to work with and in a class of eight or nine students that meant only one person could be working at a time and they had to take the clay off and the, the eyes out and move on to the next student so our students scanned and designed a couple of different skulls and those were printed out so all of those are examples of how students across the disciplines collaborate together on their project work and uh, as i said there are on campus on campus internships i mentioned two um, there are actually now uh, five different and they're still coming more and more of those we will see in the next few weeks and months. And then the last area that we've been working on quite a bit in the last few years is virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, so here are various ways that we can utilize the technology, but one in particular that just we did just this past fall uh, as Harrisburg University is constructing a new academic tower in uh, downtown Harrisburg and our students worked with the architects that are designing that building to get architectural models of that building and to develop a virtual experience where you can put the headset on uh, and then stand on the street corner and sort of look around and see what that building looks like and how it would actually uh, fit inside of the environment. The architecture firm had never done anything like this before and our students had never done anything. So it was really great to see both of those them come together and build something. And I was extremely excited with the results that they had at the end. Now, there's some bumps and bruises along the way and things that could be improved upon, but everyone learned something about the process 
and now they can iterate on that process and develop new stuff. So that's where we are today with interactive media. We are constantly looking at new directions. Um, we as a faculty get together often um, and review how courses are relating to each other, what content is being covered, what new technologies or processes are out there that we should be incorporating into our classes. So we are constantly improving um, what we do. And that constant improvement means that we can change the concentrations or create new concentrations. Sometimes it means that we've had students come to us and say, hey, I'd like to learn about X. And we do a little bit of research and we say, you know what, that should be an, a full course and we'll develop new courses around that. So with that said, I think Aaron was going to answer our, or start answering some questions. But with that being said, this is interactive media and I, I want to welcome you on behalf of the rest of the faculty. Um, we want to welcome you into the program, uh, really make you part of the community. That fall semester will come really quickly and we'll be on the ground helping you get acclimated to the university as well as learning the, the where's and the why's of interactive media. So thanks for your time. Thank you very much, Professor Palmer. That was a lot of great information and Dr. Payton, uh, thank you for chiming in as well. Uh, and we do have some questions that came in. Uh, some were actually uh, pre-posed uh, during registration and some are coming in live now. And uh, Professor Palmer, one of the first questions that came in is, um, is there coding involved in the program? And if so, how much? Um, so that's a very common question. Uh, so in the first year, second semester, there is a introduction to computer science style course where students learn Python. It's a scripting learn language. It's not a full programming language. And in, uh, in actuality, it's just enough to understand the structure of how code is written and developed. As I mentioned, the purposeful game concentration, there is almost zero coding in that particular concentration unless you add it in your elective courses. Um, and then in purposeful games and uh, user experience design, it's not coding as much as analysis of data, right? So you might be writing or acquiring small scripts that allow you to perform things faster than just you know, grabbing an Excel sheet and doing a sum and a tally. Um, so it's not true programming in any of the core. It's only if you feel that this is an area that you can excel on, you can do that in your elective courses. And another question that came in as well uh, pertaining to the programs is how much animation is involved in the program? And also, if there's animation involved, do I need any pre-experience or is that something I can work on as I go through the major? So in all honesty, if you're looking for an animation program, um, this might not be the best place. We do have a 3D or two 3D courses that students will take. One is a requirement of uh, advanced media production students and it's 3D modeling and the game, uh, purposeful game design, they both have this as a requirement. Um, the first one is learning the 3D modeling tools, and the second one is character animation and world building a little bit. Um, those are really the only courses that focus on animation, and it only does animation in the 3D space. We have had students that would work with one of our faculty members. One of our faculty members is an ex-Disney Imagineer. He's a, a children's book illustrator. Um, and so he teaches and does animation at other institutions. So we have had students work with the helm um, just on a semester to semester basis, but we don't really have a course in that. Thank you very much for that. And along the lines of the program, uh, one thing you mentioned is uh, not declaring your concentration right away. So coming into the program, do you see a lot of students coming in with one idea of what they want to do and making that change by the end of their first semester or first year? Every single week of the fall semester. Um, <laughs> So, but it's 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 expected and that's great. Um, I love it when a student comes in and is passionate about a thing, but is open minded enough to look at other things as well. That tells me you are going to be successful because you're not going to pigeonhole yourself into one area and do that regardless of whatever else comes about, but you're constantly evaluating the space, your skill set and what else is available. So the question that, you know, to answer your question, yes, Students change their mind a number of times during that first semester. Uh, this past spring, 
as I mentioned, most people declared at the start of the semester and then some change at the end. I, I believe out of 40 ish, I had two sections out of 40 of students, probably eight or nine, maybe as many as 10 switched. Um, so that second semester, you have a really strong idea of what it is you want to study. But we're, we're uh, I, again, and I, I'll stop talking about this, but we're designed so that you don't have to know right up front. Um, I do not want students coming in preconceived of what that they want to do purposeful game design because they might not know. And I'll tell you a little side story. Before we did our concentrations um, and students came in and they said they want to make games, we saw that about 70% of the student into the program wanted to make games in their first semester. By the end of the first year, that no, I'm sorry, by the end of the second year, that number was down to around 30% of those students wanted to do it. And those other 40% has switched off to other things because making games wasn't what they thought it would be. It wasn't as fun as they thought it would be, and it was actually hard work. And so uh, it's good that we've designed the program now so that students can do it that way. Great. And then also, too, I'm going to pose another question to you, kind of staying on that topic. And if, if you don't mind, Professor Palmer, this one, if you'd be able to turn your camera on. Yep. Uh, in regards to making those switches, um, how are students advised in regards to changing those concentrations, um, getting advisory on what they should be doing? Is there assistance from the faculty with this? Yes. So every student who comes in uh, to the university is assigned an advisor first off the, as soon as you get here. Um, you have very little interactions with that advisor the first semester because your courses have already been selected. Um, uh, after that first year, or pretty much really after that first semester, you're then assigned an advisor based on what your uh, what your expected concentration is going to be. So myself, I've been doing advanced media production. Um, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say it that way. Uh, so we have roughly five or six faculty members that are now subdividing and taking the students based on their concentration and advising them through the process. Um, they'll meet with their advisor a number of times during the semester, during a regular semester, uh, normally near the start of the semester, just to talk about what's coming up. Um, if they're, uh, once registration comes about or mid-semester, if they're having any issues around mid-semester, we'll reach out. But then as they register for the next semester, we expect them to all meet with their advisor just to make sure there's no snafus or they're not having any issues with registration process. Um, and then in your junior year, normally, when you're working on your project one and then in your senior year when you're doing project two, you'll work with your advisor a lot more and another advisor sometimes from the university on that project work. So yeah, your, 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 your advisors are there if you want them. If you don't want your advisors, sometimes we're a little pushy, um, but you can do the process yourself. Thank you very much. And actually, um, let me, let me, let me fix that. Uh, sure. Or let me at least mention some students have tried to do it all on their own without asking for help. And it's meant that they had problems later on down the road. So it is much better that you meet with your advisor when they reach out and say, hey, haven't heard from you in a while. Let's set up a meeting via Skype or, or we use Teams at the university um, or whatever, top of my office, whatever. Um, it's good to take advantage of that. And with the program, of course, we do have our Philadelphia campus as well. Um, are any of these areas offered in Philadelphia for the students who study down there? So right now, advanced media production is offered there. Starting this fall, purposeful game design will also be offered in Philadelphia. Um, when we opened the Philadelphia campus and we started looking at concentrations there, we wanted to make sure that the audience was available to take those classes. So we didn't dump all three concentrations. We started with what students have asked for. Um, and now that we've done purposeful games, already students are now asking for user experience design. So I envision in the next year or so, we'll be rolling that concentration into the Philadelphia campus as well. And then the university has two new campuses that are coming out shortly, and we'll be talking about those also. And really just one final question as we wrap up here. And Dr. Payton, I'll have you uh, turn on your camera and um, maybe give some input as well. But a lot of questions I get as being an admissions counselor uh, is just about being prepared for this program. So are, are there any recommendations you have that will allow students to prepare themselves for going into a program like this uh, during high school? Dr. Payton, you want to go first and then I'll follow up? I need a minute to think about that question. Oh, okay, so um, I'll go and then you go. 
OK, um, so one of the things I often say is passion. Um, it's OK to not be sure of exactly what it is you want to study, but be prepared to study. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we have students who come in and say, uh, I've seen the type of work that's done in, in, in uh, interactive media, and I'm interested in that stuff, or I'm interested in this a little more than this, but I want to learn more about it. As long as you have some interest in it, we can walk you through the process. The students who don't do well in this program are those who are not motivated or not passionate about what's going on. So they're just taking the classes as we've told them to take the classes. They're doing the minimum amount of work to try and get a passing grade, and they're not really engaged. We talk to our students a lot in those advising meetings about finding the things you want to do. My first advising meeting students, uh, I asked them, and actually almost everyone, I said, what do you want to do when you graduate? And I expect for that freshman year them to have no clue, and, and that's OK. Uh, but as I keep asking, they're learning more and more about things that interest them, and we're talking about what interests them. And their advisors are helping them drive that process to get to the career they want. Uh, that's probably the most common thing that, that we say to students is, well, what do you want to do when you graduate? And now we can help you get there. Sometimes helping you get there is taking courses that aren't necessarily on the books, but we push you uh, through electives. And in some cases, Dr. Payton will admit or, or, or sort of uh, clarify this a little more is we've actually created new courses for some students or new delivery methods so that we can get them what they need to get the job they need. Uh, and so long winded passion and a real interest to learn uh, will make you successful in this program. Yeah, I suppose if I was to add on to that, I would say that uh, the other thing that would be really, really useful or that would be really important as a mindset would be to just be curious about why the things that we use that are digital are the way they are and just pay attention to what do you like, what don't you like, what works, what makes you want to throw your phone across the room um, and just sort of pay attention to um, what is happening out there in the world and the ways in which we use digital stuff. And because that's the sort of insights that you can then bring into that passion that you have. So that curiosity for um, what is available, what might be different, and how can you be part of the reason why that thing could be different? Well said. You're muted, Aaron. You're a pro. My apologies for that. I always catch myself on mute sometimes. Yep. <laughs> but with it, with that in mind, um, we are coming up to time here, and we appreciate the questions that have came in. Uh, Professor Palmer, uh, Dr. Payton, thank you very much uh, for being able to take the time again today uh, to be able to share this information. Uh, and again, if you have more questions from the audience going forward, uh, feel free to reach out to undergraduate admissions at harrisburgu.edu. Uh, this will be provided probably in the next 24 to 48 hours uh, on the webinar link that I provided in the chat as well. But other than that, uh, everybody stay safe. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day, and we'll talk to you again soon. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.